Good afternoon. Welcome back to the BH Virtual Event Space. You're tuned into another episode of 10 Images, 10 Stories. And what's so cool about today's episode is it's kind of the heart of what the event space has become of getting wonderful, talented photographers on, but we build that bond. So I'd like to welcome Jim Sullivan, who's not only a super talented photographer in his own right, but I now think of him as a friend. You know, we we met when I brought you on as part of the the Leica Conversations series and he's such an inspiration to me and i think that's the really cool thing about what we do here is we're we're building out the community and you're somebody that i've looked up to your work and now it's like you know we're we're peers i can't shoot the way you shoot i'm working on it but you know that's that's how i'm going to lay it out there today man it's it's an honor to have you on i want to thank you for for joining us again i didn't scare you off the first time so Welcome. Oh man. no. Uh, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here and excited to talk to you again. And uh, I noticed the new addition to the uh I the had to turn it up, part. man. I had yeah, to switch it up. I love it. The, the look was getting a little stale. Yeah, I, I wish I had the same gumption to be able to rock the uh, the stash, but I just I just can't do it. It takes a a good man to be able to do that. I'm just, I'm not there. <laughs> Give it six months, six months. We're bringing you back. I'm, I'm going to do like Danny and I often like to put out challenges to our speakers yeah. and we'll say next time we have you back, you got to come rocking a little stash. Oh, I'll do it. I'll do it. Yeah. There we go. I mean, I can definitely grow one. I did one for uh, November a couple of years ago to raise some money, but um, I don't think my wife liked it too much, but <laughs> Oh, it's, man, my wife yeah. is sitting right off camera with the clippers in her hand. She hates the mullet. She hates the stash. <laughs> At least yeah. when I grow the beard out a little bit, the stash kind of blends in. Yeah, it you looks know. good on you, dude. Yeah, Thank it does you, look man. good on you. Yeah, Thank sure. you. Well, you know what's interesting about today is, you know, we've been doing this 10 images, 10 stories thing. And I love the direction you took of taking a lens that isn't often used probably because it's a difficult lens to use. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, so sure talk to us, talk to us a little bit about, uh, what you're going to be using um, while you're doing that, I'm going to pull up the the images here because we have a beautiful image of that lens and uh, okay. we'll kind of get everything kicked off right now, Jim. So talk to yeah. us about what we're going to be looking at today. So uh, the it kind of came uh, about in a long way. Uh, I've always loved the M system. And for me, using the M system, you know, typically it's, most people think about M uh, system is for street photography, which I love to do. I don't do it nearly as much as I'd like to, but um, I use it when I can. But then a couple months ago, when Leica announced the, the 50 Summerlux close focus, I was really intrigued because um, when I got to learn about the lens, how the minimum focus distance, I think is, uh, 0.9 meters, which for me, being able to get into that range was really in my wheelhouse for uh, for what I do, which is mainly focus on food and cocktail photography. And so uh, when I reached out to them, my guy at the Leica store in San Francisco, um, we talked about it and I, you know, I wanted to try it because it's like, knowing how the M system works and the look that you get from it, I was really intrigued. And so they sent it over and I was just blown away immediately by the rendering um, just out of camera. I mean, the lens is not easy to use, uh, especially for what I do typically, but when I nail the focus, it's just dreamy. It's, um, I mean, it sounds cliche, but it really is the bokeh. I'm not a big bokeh person, but looking at the images out of camera is just mind blowing. And then, so I wanted to get this lens to kind of like take my work into a different direction. Because um, typically when I'm on set or a location, I'm using the SL2, which is a fantastic camera. Um, I mean, that's been my workhorse, but the look I get from the M system, that's an M10R with the, the 50 Summerlux and the, lens, the images that I get from that is just, it's just different. They render differently. Uh, I'm not, I'm not real techie in terms of like um, knowing the ins and outs of the, the sensors, but I do know they're slightly different. And so the images I get off the M10R with that lens, 
it's a lot different than what I'm getting with the SL2S, um, which I, that this new system is, that I'm using is amazing. It's just the only drawback to it, which isn't really a drawback, but it's, uh, you I really have to slow down. Mm. And uh, it kind of reminds me of working with film. Uh, when I use my M6 or any film camera, you know, it really makes me slow down and really think about um, the my angles and uh, how I'm shooting. And with this, it's kind of the same thing when I'm using this setup. It makes me slow down and focus on composition, and uh, which is good. I mean, yeah. you know, being some, sometimes I actually I used it yesterday uh, in the kitchen uh, to get some images with it. And, you know, it's somewhat difficult to use, uh, in, in the kitchen because everything's moving so fast, you know, it's manual focus. So then I think about my approach into that scenario. I mean, do I do more like a zone focusing as if I'm on the street, uh, which I started to do with this setup. And sometimes what I'll do also is like find a certain, um, set up that I like in terms of uh, what I'm looking at the frame and then I'll just kind of pre-focus and then when something happens that I'm looking at looking for then I'll take a snap but a lot of times I'm just going the opposite where I'm setting at f8 and you know zone focusing that way and then it becomes a lot easier but um, it just makes me work differently than I'm used to which is kind of cool because the challenge definitely and it, and it, and includes that you have to have so much more intent and i love that you did bring up the zone focusing thing because the beauty of a lens like this is when you can stop down and get that really shallow depth of field and mm -hmm. and i think that's what you know when when you are or, excuse me open it wide up and you open mm -hmm. it wide up and have that razor sharp depth of field because of the way it renders the out of focus areas if you don't have a lens like that and a system that really takes those out of focus areas and makes them beautiful to look at, it can become very distracting. Like you look at it, yeah. you know, even, even an image like this, where you look at what's out of focus is still not distracting. It's still beautiful. And it kind of dr draws your eye right to what is in focus. So I, I arranged these images in such a way so that we're going to start on the street. We're going to take to some portraits and, you know, you did talk about zone focusing where you can get away outside on the street or taking portraits with that richer, mm -hmm. deeper depth of field. But by the time we get to the the end of the images, we're gonna be looking at those bread and butter shots of food and drink, where mm -hmm. the shallow depth of field, you have to have it and you have to nail it or else the shot doesn't doesn't yeah. deliver. So let's uh, no. let's start here. What are we looking uh, at? I, I included this one, one, because actually it was one of the first images I took with this setup, but also because it's Chinese New Year and. You know, I'm in an Asian household, so it kind of uh, wanted to pay homage to Chinese New Year. But anyway, uh, this image is just, um, I was doing some work in San Francisco at Mr. Jews, and, which is in Chinatown. And then they have these similar to the um, Chinatown in New York. They, you know, have the lights drawn across the street. And, it's, and whenever I go there, just really draws my eye and I wanted to capture this in sort of like a weird different angle and you know not the typical angle but I thought it kind of worked um and wanted to incorporate the street lamp and um I'm always drawn to red I don't know why but I just am but um that's what that is and that's with the that it was probably the first one or two images I took with that camera set up and I, I think images like this, what I love when, especially when testing a lens out is you want to give, I think everyone, everyone wants to go to the, the home run setup. They want to go to perfect light, perfect setup. Something like this is challenging. Mm -hmm. You have bright lights, you have your dark areas, you can see the areas that are dim. It really tests the resolution and, and the rendering of the ses of the system. And mm -hmm. I look to the areas like as the light falls off, the detail in the in the areas that aren't so well lit and are the are the the lit areas too bright you know are you getting highlights way clipped 
And that's where that dynamic range starts to come in. And, and I think that's what I look out there and you really want to test. I look at that American flag in the background. It's like just little details like that, that catch my eye when I look at the frame. And obviously you have that lamp in, like, in the lower right third that. Yeah. I have another image with, um, at a different angle uh, that didn't have the street lamp, but I don't know, it might be a better image. Maybe I should have maybe included it, but I don't I, know. I like, this one just worked. I, yeah, it, it just works for me. It shows the detail. And I think something like this is, you know, for me, it's it's the details in the fire escapes and the ironwork and the yeah. lantern and, and the lamps and all of that stuff. And I think that's what's so cool. You know, I had this conversation with somebody the other day that you need images that that set the stage that you have your images like this, that it tells, you know, how many people look up and they just take an image of details like this. And I think that's what's yeah. so cool. Yeah, I was going to say, I agree. I've been trying to incorporate like, um, not an establishing shop, but something of reference to where I'm working. And like for me in Chinatown, like that just screams like, you, you know where that is. I mean, if you don't know it's San Francisco, but you know it's, a Chinatown or an, you know an Asian neighborhood, so um, that's kind of what I've been trying to incorporate into my work more. Definitely, and it, it helps tell the story. Now, where where is this? This isn't the usual Jim Sullivan shot. This kind of this kind <laughs> no. of caught me off guard. <laughs> I know. Uh, I would love this shot. I, this is my uh, quote unquote Dallas cowboy. Um, I had a layover in Dallas, uh, like November, something like that, and um, I. Honestly, I wish it was my monochrome, but it was off the M10R and I just converted it to black and white just because to me, like it worked. Like uh, I'm not a, like uh, some people, photographers are like strictly black and white and some are color. For me, it kind of depends on the image and what I'm photographing. But like sometimes uh, when I'm editing, I'll, if it looks to me that it might work in black and white, then I'll just convert it like if I'm not working strictly in black and white, but for me, this worked in black and white. Um, and so this was just a random shot at the at, at Dallas uh, airport, at Dallas Fort Worth. And, um, you know, I've not ever really get to shoot cowboys. So when I saw this guy, I actually followed, <laughs> I followed him <laughs> down the uh, concourse or whatever. And then I just went, I knew there was light that was coming through the ceiling. So I just waited for him to walk through and I just, one frame that's just captured it that way and so it's not my usual but i really like it so now i can at least say i've photographed a cowboy well and what's great about this is knowing what you're using to shoot mm -hmm. it i think adds to the as, as any street photographer knows there's a lot of luck involved oh and absolutely it's it's like how many times do we miss barely you know and it's like in street photography 95 percent is not a good you know, if you get 95% there and you didn't nail it, it's like, no, that's, that's a wash for me. I throw that out. And I think for, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's all those close calls that make it so much more satisfying when you do nail it and knowing what you're shooting with and something, it is not easy. I mean, I know that we live in a spoiled yeah. world now of autofocus, but it's not easy to, to go out there and shoot a nail a shot like this manual focus. Oh no, I think my hit rate for street photography when I do it is is really low <laughs> like it's, join the club but when you, yeah when you get that one image like i could be out for hours doing street photography and i get one image that works in composition light and then it's so in focus then i'm happy like i'm i, I can call it a, a, a successful day but um yeah i think you know using the m system which everything is manual as you know like the focusing the everything is it, it, it's down to its core in terms of like how you know you use it versus like say if i had the queue or like another system that if everything's auto then it's not cheating but it's just like for me it, it like being having to really slow down and think about what i'm doing with the um the m system it it, it makes it that more enjoyable and then knowing like from a lot of the greats that I study, that's, you know, what they're doing is they're zone focusing and they're, you know, um, using the, the like M system. So 
I don't know when I get one like something like this for me, I, I really dig it. Yeah, it's an appreciation of the of the craft and of slowing the process down and just the little details here. Like my eye is taken, you know, it's like you have that that light border at the top that cuts across and then it comes back down and kind of leads right into him in a non-distracting Yeah. way. It kind of just like brings your eye right to there and then it goes to an area of really dark contrast. But again, you still have that detail, the the kiss of light on the right side of the brim that gives that little rim light to just that curve. beautiful man Yeah, and he and he's got that he's rocking that Fu Man Shu stash he's with he's the got red. the real stash there like that, yeah that's like a that's Yeah, like the that's man's like a real man cowboy stash stash. Yeah, definitely like the... <laughs> the colors so man Th this one yeah, just pops out the colors the chair everything the expression that chair. Yeah, I love that chair. So when I saw the chair at the the location, I had to use it. And then since like I was saying earlier, I'm just I have this affinity for red and I asked her if I could photograph her and that red. Um just really popped like I've been on this uh Kodachrome kick for the last couple of months and so whenever I'm out and I see red I'm I think of lighter and or Haas and the the reds they have McMurray McCurry and so um I edited it a little bit more of like to get that look to it so um but yeah I just really like it. it's just a nice moment the light but then that pops that color And I think this is also the the good example of that Leica look that, you know, a lot of people can't explain, but they know it when they see it, just the way that it renders and Mm hmm the colors. Red is red is a tricky color, too, because a, a lot of systems don't handle red so well. And red, especially Mm hmm if you post process it or light it the wrong way, it can bleed into itself. It can be it's easily it's easy to become oversaturated. And, and then if you kind of take the saturation out, it, you can lose that real pop of the red that you like. mm it's yeah it's funny you say that because I have an image that I took in um in Tokyo a couple of months ago and there was a, it was a street street um vendor and there were two gals uh cooking over open fire and it was a really nice image but they had these red jackets on but it did not like I didn't somehow I don't know I didn't catch it right and so I, well, I didn't like the image but like so I, I get that red's really tricky Yeah, it totally is. And it's it's one of those things that for years I struggled and I'm like, is it me? Am I not handling it right? And I think sometimes it's probably probably 90% me, but also 10%. Red is just red's a difficult color. As as attractive as it is and it is eye catching, it is a difficult color to uh to nail. Yeah. So I love this this. one, yeah, I, I mean, I don't like, I like to do other things other than, I mean, I love, you know, food and cocktails, like chef stuff is like my, my uh, bread and butter, so to speak. But I love to do other things other than that. So like whether it's portraits, street photography, but this is actually my tattoo artist, uh, Yushi. And so I've um, been working on a short project or a small project with him, uh, mostly on motion, but the day I went to um, film him, I had the uh, M10R with me. And uh, this is just him uh, doing his thing. But um, I just, I don't know, I that had a wide open, Uh, and then had the focal point on the tattoo gun, and then it just the way everything is lit, it just really popped for me. The whole that whole set is just like easy, like butter. Yeah. Do you do a lot of personal work on the side? How much in personal I work do you incorporate? um so I think when I'm not doing like the whole chef food stuff, then um. out doing personal stuff because I just one I always I don't know why I always feel like I need to be doing working 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 and whether it's personal stuff or trying new things um that way when I go back to like the whole food and cocktail thing I I I feel like it helps me approach it differently so the last few weeks have been slow for me in terms of like the whole food and cocktail thing but Uh, which has been, it's fine, because then I'm able to kind of go back to doing our work on personal projects. Like I'm I'm doing one now about diners. And so I've been trying, 
Yeah, I, I didn't incorporate any of the diner images because I'm holding off on it, all that stuff. But um, I'm always up doing something, you know, but I have to always ask the other wife first. <laughs> Gotta get the permission slip signed always. Yeah, yeah. I know that's right. And see, now I gotta, I gotta keep you. Uh, you gotta keep me up to date on that one because my high school friends and I was like, that was our thing back in the day. Growing up in oh, New Jersey, really? New Jersey yeah, and yeah. diners, man. It's like that's diner land. We used to do the oh, diner uh, tour. Ooh, man, I'm I'm all about that. Uh, I, I love think... like so. For, there's places like for me that really get me are diners, and I, I've I've been working on this one for years, but I. Haven't been doing it lately. Is dive bars? Oh, I love, love that. Dive, I love, I love dive that. bars, but that kind of gritty kind of just like stuff. That's like really where I really like working. Um, so uh, and then tattoo parlors, but um, I might I, have to take you up on the Jersey thing. Oh yeah, dude. We got to, look. We got great dive bars in New York. Great diners out in Jersey, and I think that kind of pieces it together with your work because there is a juxtaposition. There's a a lot of the food and drink that you're shooting is super, super elevated, but mm -hmm. you bring an edge to it and it's totally you. It's like you put your stamp on it, whether you see it or not, it doesn't look your work. You're taking stuff that looks very what's for fragile where it's like, you don't want to touch mm -hmm. you don't, but you, you give it like this, like this cool, hip edge to it, which I love as we're, we're starting, we're starting to move, closer in what what is your take i mean what's your approach as we start to get into the images that are getting closer to the, the food and drink mm -hmm. what is your take when you're going into the kitchen or when you're shooting food and drink what mentality are you trying to bring and add to the images uh well it, it's funny that you say that um what you just said because honestly like you kind of hit it the nail on the head i mean that's what i do on my personal work like the dive bars and diners tattoo and even to a degree like surf stuff um i take that approach or my mindset into what i'm doing professionally so the fact that you said that is exactly what i'm th you know thinking on it and then if it renders that way or comes across the viewer that way then that's amazing because that's what, exactly what i'm trying to do but um i to answer your question i think uh it sort of depends my approach sort of to a degree of what i'm doing so if i'm in the back of the house or in the kitchen i'm actually mindset wise i'm thinking about how i would approach it to street photography kind of like waiting for that moment to happen being a fly in the wall and then like like yesterday i'm like have it reset to where i wanted to Photograph and the angle that I wanted and the light was where I wanted it. And then I just kind of wait and then I'll take a few frames and then move. So I'm always moving in terms of like uh, my angles and um, my approach and then uh, in the frame. So this one, I, I've been, oh, the other thing I've, lately I've been trying to do too is I've been trying to add more layers into my images, um, mm. especially with like the street stuff. Like I'm trying to like, you know, like I said, I've been studying a lot of Saul Leiter's work and, and I've been trying to get a lot of layers, whether it's like a a window, shooting through a window to get depth, you know. But this one, this is funny because this is a really tiny kitchen. Uh, this is my buddy's up at, the, it's called Atelier Mana, which is in um, Lucadia, Encinitas area. And there is, um, it's a really small kitchen. So I'm like maybe... I don't know, six feet from where these guys are at. So I'm like, it's really tiny. I actually had my camera kind of like this up against the wall, just waiting um, and then trying to get that depth. So um, I wanted to, uh, waiting for them to kind of like do their thing and then probably took, I don't know, maybe six frames and then moved. But this is one of them. I wanted to focus on the, the, the CDC, the chef de cuisine in the hat and then the executive chefs to the right and he's you know blurred out but i wanted to focus to go on the guy in the hat how much knowledge is required of food industry stuff we see it in other aspects of photography wildlife is easy because it's one of those things where it's a, it's a great example to draw where you have to know animals 
and the behavior of animals to really tap the full potential of wildlife photography. Does that apply in the kitchen world? Or you can can you just go into it with, hey, I, I have a good eye. I understand light. I'm just going mean, to fire away. I think, I mean, technically, you probably don't. Um, I mean, I think if you know what you're doing and you have the eye, then just go and do your thing. But for me, since I know kitchens and know how the process is when um, the tickets come in, that they're getting fired, and then the, you see the result chefs doing their thing and then plating and then how that works um, and knowing where to, I think one of the key things is knowing where to stand and when and when not to. And so knowing how they, that gets out dance. They're in the back of the house, they're in the kitchen, it's, they call it a dance. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, that helps me, at least I know where not to stand or to be out of the way. And like, usually when I go in to work with a new team, you know, I let them know, I, I pretty much know what's going on. So I'll try to stay out of your way and like, I'll do my thing. So like, if I need to go in real tight, um, I'll kind of wait and then kind of go in real tight and then take a few frames and then back out to kind of get out of the way. So, you know, I'm in there doing the dance, so to speak. So I think it helps me. That's a little bit, a little bit of something. Yeah. Ah, here we go, man. This is, you do yeah, the food so... justice, man. It, I don't even know what it is <laughs> and I probably wouldn't want to eat it, but you make me want to at least try it. Well, it's funny that you say that because like um, this is okra uh, and I, I grew up in Boston and then I, not until moving out here that I even like knew what the hell that was. And so <laughs> I haven't had uh, okra very often. And then this is shot at Helen, a fantastic restaurant in Birmingham. And so when Chef brought that out, I was like, okay, I'm down. Like, you know, I and I would say that if I could eat okra the way that uh, Helen did it at that, I would eat it every day. That was phenomenal. That's that's like oh, the one dish yeah. that changes your mind about it, a certain Yeah. Food. So, well, also it could be a problem too, because next time I have okra, it, hopefully it will, it will be as good as that. But it's that's a, that set the bar high on that dish. That dish was fantastic. What As far as the framing, I found mm. for me – and I'm probably not alone. Composition and framing is, I think that's where I get lost in food and drink. You know, mm. most of the time I'm taking food and drink pictures. I'm trying to not let anybody know that I'm taking them while I stand up on my chair at the local Applebee's. But no, nah, I'm joking. But um, <laughs> like, I don't think you're the Applebee's, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, man. Dinner. Let's go. It's on me. Oh, all right, cool. H how do you handle composition? Like, does each dish, or is there like rules that you follow for what kind of dish it is, or colors, or how the plate yeah. is? I think for me, the way that I approach a dish, say, is it really depends on how chef uh, presents it. So. Some dishes like this one's, it's pretty flat. So to get even like that 45 degree angle can be tough, but this one works for me, it works because of the textures, um, you know, the okra itself. And then I think that was cornbread. I can't remember what that fried part of it was, but this one worked at that angle because of the textures. But like, let's say you go and you get a flat taco I'm really not going to photograph it at a 45. That one dictates that I shoot it overhead just because it's flat. Um, but typically when I approach a dish or anything really, um, I'll take a couple hero shots and then I'll move and work the table, so to speak, where I'll get a few 45 and then I'll get a few vertical. And then, you know, I may stand up on the chair or for me, since some little vertically challenged, I'll uh, get on a ladder and shoot down <laughs> at it. So, <laughs> it, but I, I usually get different angles for sure. And then the then what I also do, and I always tell clients this, like I'll get the hero shot, like dish, the dish by itself. Because um, some dishes really work well when it's just the dish by itself, you know, and, and it, mm -hmm. there's nothing else to distract it. It's, um, but then I'll try to incorporate other aspects so like 
this dish looks as if you're sitting at the table getting ready to dig into it. So I have the cocktail and the napkins. And so for me, it's just like when I see it as a viewer, it looks like, oh, I'm sitting at a table. I'm going to eat that. So that's kind of what I what I'm trying to do with this image. That's interesting you say that because now that you say it, it it makes more sense in my head. And I also look at it differently. And And I was looking at it differently without hearing you vocalize that, that it's not mm. just a plate on a table. And I think so many times when you see food, it's literally just a plate. Of, like it's clearly for display and it looks like mm -hmm. it's for display. And this actually does look like a table you would sit down like this literally looks like you walked up to somebody's table before they got to eat their food and were like, okay, here, let me jump in here. Yeah, and, exactly. And do my thing. Um, so, but I would say like, let's say you were my client though. I would say that for sure you'll get the image of the dish by itself. Okay. You know, like, so what I might do is like have another table off, off camera off, so you don't see it, but off to the side where I'll take that same ochre dish and photograph it by itself to get all the angles and, you know, to get that body of work and then add it to this. So you get that lifestyle kind of approach to the dish. So, you know, they might want to use like this for some sort of different ad versus like the hero shot for another type of advertising or the website or whatever. So yeah, that's okay. kind of usually how I approach it. All right. That makes sense. So you're, you're kind of getting, giving yourself options, giving the client options. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And what I'll say about this one, though, with, with the, that lens, um, normally I li when I teach my classes at Leica, the academies, I tell the students, which is true, that I live at 5.6 as far as an f-stop. For me, like, it gives enough, like, um, depth of field where the food is in focus and everything looks like it's supposed to, but everything else around it is a little bulked out, you know? But with this, it's at 1.4, it's it's wide open. So it's a little bit more narrow of a focus than I would normally use for um, the SL2. But for me, it just works and, and it's different. Like I'm trying to do something different in terms of my work. And and so for me, it, you know, it it's kind of where I'm at with the, mm -hmm. um, using that system. And I think this is, there's just a certain unwritten unspoken thing that you just have to have an eye for how the plate's going to be turned what's going to be facing where i look here mm -hmm. and it's of course you made it look nice because you have the eye for this but if i got this plate and i turned it even 30 degrees 45 degrees spun it completely around it totally changes the dynamic especially when you're shooting with the shallow depth of field like the first thing that catches my eye is the texture of the okra and I think that's what you want, right? You want, yeah, you want to make sure exactly your focus is, yeah. I mean, that's always something I think people struggle with too, especially when shooting food with a shallow depth of field is where is the focus point? Where, what are you focusing on? How is the plate turned? What's behind what? Everything here just looks, it looks great because you've served it up to us great. But did you have to, do you do the work? Do you, when when they bring the, the plate out, what's, um, what's the process so... for you? Usually, I would say I try to take capture the food as if how chef brought it out. Um, there are some times when I either have a, a really good rapport with the chef that I'm working with. Um, if I see something that I'm like, hey, what do you think about? Are you okay if I, let's say, move this component of the dish? Because, you know, being a chef myself, I know like when I put it on a plate a certain way. And that's how I really want the diner or the viewer to see it. So I'm very mindful of not like effing with someone else's food. So like if you were a chef and you brought that okra dish out and there was some part of the component that's maybe I see that's off a little bit, I'll ask you first. And most of the time like, oh yeah, dude, like whatever you see. So, um, I, but I'm very mindful of that. Yeah, end of the drinks. This is my fa my favorite part. I love when you post drink images. I mean, it's it's so hard to do. There's not much to work with when you have a drink, right? Yeah, I but I kind of like it that way though too because like as full, especially at, this is at um, Moongate Lounge, which is uh, 
uh, Mr. Jew's cocktail bar above the restaurant. That thing, like, yeah, you you can't take a bad picture in that spot. But like again, for red, see, like I noticed the red uh, velvet uh, seats in the back, and I was like, I got to photograph something there. And so when we did the cocktail, I knew that. Um, I wanted that in the background. And then that's actually my son holding the cocktail. And so he's got beautiful ink. So I wanted to kind of get that edgy kind of like, um, you know, edginess to the image itself. And so, um, yeah. That's your stamp and on it's it. Beautiful. Yeah, kind of. I mean, that's for me, that's like, I don't want to say a signature image, but that's that's me on a um, in an image, kind of. It's, it, it's elegant, a way to add beautiful. interest. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you added yeah. environment and interest to something that's like, look, the drink is a, it's a simple drink. That's I think that's more ice than they put in the drinks at Chick Fil A. But you gotta you gotta <laughs> add your you gotta add your spin to it. That's yeah. that's a drink my wife would be like. She'd come back and she'd yell at me. She'd be like, "My, why is there all, all this ice in my drink? What uh, what was that drink? Do you know what the drink is?" Oh man. I should know it, and I just I don't remember. But I'm actually going to be working with these guys again in a couple of weeks uh, for the for the Like Academy, and so oh, nice. I'll I'll show them this image, and I'm like, make me that again, so I can have it, and then I'll text you and tell you what it is. Yeah, text me. Let I me know. I remember we had a few of those um, after, and I was like, <laughs> I was going to say, I was going to say, any drink that simple's got to be strong. That thing's got to be hitting. It, it was so good, so so wow, good. It looks it. I love this simple, just a little pop of color. And I think I've, look, your color work is so colorful. And I think this is why we vibe, man, because we're the same in, in like, it's either black and white. The colors, if I'm going to go color, it's got to be full tilt color. Like the colors just got to mm. really pop and like something really has to draw my eye. And for this, it's like, it's a, it's a departure from that. It's like, it's nice. It's classy. It's just a, the enough pop of the color, even the way you play in the background. I love what you do in your out of focus areas on your images and the way you work the shapes and talk yeah, to you, man. I, I've been trying to, like I said earlier, like um, add more layers and depth to my images. And so I actually picked out that spot because of the chair itself. And I, I had just my one pro photo strobe off of camera right. And so, uh, but I specifically lit it that way because I wanted to capture the, uh, the some of the texture and chair in the background. So, um, and if you notice, it's actually a little bit like the focal point is the rim of the glass of the martini, but the lemon is kind of out of focus, which you know, if I was shooting it for an agency or like a cocktail book, you know, they probably wouldn't like it because the lemon's out of focus. Like they would want the lemon and the olives in focus as well. Mm -hmm. But for me, I, I don't, I like it. I mean, it doesn't have to be perfect. Yeah, I like it. And and one of the good things about when you shoot on an angle at a shallow depth of field is the various points of focus that you'll get across different planes because you're not looking at you know i think we humans are accustomed to looking at everything on one flat plane and when you break that plane you'll get the rim of the glass in focus but you you see the ornate detail on the serving tray mm -hmm. and it's just mm -hmm. that in and out of focus that kind of plays with your brain in ways and i think that's what makes certain images so pleasing is it takes you on a wave of focus and out of focus at least for me i, I love images that it's it's a little complexity that it adds the even a simple framing. Yeah, I agree. I think it's. I mean, it, it's a little subtle uh, in terms of what you're um, pointing out. And actually, there was a question from Chris uh, on the on the chat. Is like if I ever use strobes with the M, and this is exactly a perfect example. Is I have the um, my Pro Photo uh, connector on top and just the one strobe camera right and that's it how often um, do you have to i mean especially with this lens with that shallow depth of field it's a fast good low light lens do you find yourself using off-camera lighting well, water well i mean i honestly i've just started working with this system 
Um, so I haven't had too many um, professional shoots with mm -hmm. it. Uh, maybe two. Yeah, two. Um, but I mean, if it dictates that I use strobes and I mean, I'm able to, you know, do it now. It's just, like I said earlier, it, it really takes me to slow down and really think about composition and lighting is definitely um, something that uh, I really have to be mindful about. Um, yeah. So it's not easy. I mean, at least for me, it's not easy. I mean, I'm still like, you know, trying to, I guess, figure out as I go. I think that's great. And and that's okay. That's what we're all doing. It's like being a yeah, professional I'm photographer is your problem solver. You're finding solutions. Yeah, I'm, I'm not afraid to make a mistake because I feel like if I'm not putting myself out there, and then what the hell am I doing? I mean, I'm not going to yeah. be playing it safe, you know? So, I mean, trying. I would have I would have never seen strobe in this. And that's what I think is so interesting too. And I always love, I think that's the mark of a great photographer is that you can't tell how it was lit. And I find myself time and time again coming back to images that I just know they're lit well, but I don't mm. know how. And you don't really question it at that point. You just enjoy it. And I think when something is too glaring, it takes your your mind away from the strength of the image and it just makes you like oh that was that's really glaring there will she turn down the light in the the back or the ambience a little too bright or something's too hot or yeah i mean i maybe some people wouldn't like this image which it's fine i get but for me i i like it and now that i think of it i actually had um i actually used two strobes on this one um and it's actually all i have usually when i travel for sheets i only have two i i have my b10 and then the uh, is it the A A one, which is like a I love that little lens or uh, light. It's like you can use it on camera, sit on top of the hot shoe, or take it off. And if you look, um, I had that little stro or little light left of the chair in the back to get that rim of the the chair on it. And I don't know if you can tell, but I yeah. wanted that to kind of pop a little bit, so I just barely. It was like really low power and just to focus on the, the, the rim of the chair to kind of get that in focus too. I love that. It's that attention to detail. So there's yeah, that pop of color. Yeah. This one is just window light, but um it, that was a beautiful cocktail. Uh it's at, this is in Birmingham at Slim's. Um that's their I think it cocktail it is, but so it's super narrow focus, but you know it worked for me. I love it; it just works. Um, now, if that, you're a uh, texture, if you're a bar, man. I know. But if you're a bartender, they might say, you know, maybe that doesn't work for you because, like, I know a lot of bartenders don't want. If you look really closely at the glass, they don't want that uh, the the condensation on the on the glass itself. That that's what I. That's the first thing that catches my eye. And that condensation is what brings me in, especially that it's in that specular highlight. Yeah. That, that right there. And I think that's the perfect example of using a shallow depth of field where your eye goes right to it. And when I see condensation on a drink, it's like it's like the old beer commercials from the 90s when you know <laughs> they they made you, it's like you're watching a beer commercial, you're 12 years old, and you're like licking your lips, like, wow, that looks refreshing. And little do you know, it's like it, tastes horrible and <laughs> that didn't taste horrible at all <laughs> um, but i think technically speaking like one it's it's too shallow of a focus and the other part of it is if i was shooting it for say in vibe magazine or whatever they probably wouldn't want the concentration on it but this is just for me um but i i like it so i don't care it's interesting and and i think it opens up another conversation i was actually having this conversation earlier with who are we shooting for? Are we shooting for other people? Are we shooting for us? Obviously, if you're getting paid and you're right. doing commercial work, right? the answer is right there. It's like, it's not your name at the bottom of the check. You got to do what they want. But I think this yeah. is the beauty of personal work. Exactly. I know. I completely agree. Like, I'm very mindful of, like, maybe sometimes to a, to a fault of, like, you know, there have been instances, even recently, where I'm trying to capture what I think they want or what they've they've expressed to me what they want versus doing what I 
do uh, innately like what I feel it works for my body of work. So that can get kind of tough. So like luckily for this one, I was just there. And they, this is just for fun. So I like it. So I'm Why sure. not? This is at the same bar Slims in um, uh, Birmingham and it's a French 75 and it's just window light um, backlit. Uh, I don't know. I, again, it's super narrow, but I like it. No, I, I, it's the perfect example again of that shallow depth of field where if you have it beautifully framed, beautifully lit, again, the out of focus areas, not enough people pay attention to what's out of focus. The the chairs, the arches of the chairs, even though they're out of focus, they're important because Mm -hmm. it can be just as distracting as something that is off in focus. And I think that makes such a difference. It's kind of like there was just this space there in the middle of the frame that the glass just sits perfectly in the light, the gradation, you know, you know, that, that gradient of deep Mm -hmm. yellow down to clear, you know, closer to clear at the bottom, but Mm -hmm. the highlights aren't flipped. Everything's just perfect. But I think it's that this is the perfect example on both scales of when you have a nice fall off in light, a nice fall off in, in a depth of field with that, that, you know, sharp to blur. And Mm -hmm. then the color, the color is subtle, but there's enough of a pop. I think the, the entire color scale works. It's such a beautiful palette. It's, um, it's funny. Like when I do cocktails like, like this, um, I kind of think of, I'm doing it as, as a portrait. I don't know if that makes sense, but like, totally. I, I, I kind of like, if this was a portrait, I would still want that same kind of hot vibe or feel to it. Where like, the, you just said the light falls off, you get the bokeh in the back. And so I don't know. That's kind of how I approached that. Yeah. One. It's details for me. Even like the left side of the glass, that little kiss of rim light. Yeah. And, and you know, and when you're shooting stuff like this, you have that same rim light on the lemon peel. Stuff like that is so important, especially when you're I... shooting product and close up food and drink. Having mm-hmm. that, you know, we respond to contrast. Our brains, our eyes respond to contrast. And it's that difference between light and dark and shadows and highlights that really makes stuff stand out. And especially when you're shooting product. If you don't have at least some area where you have an edge formed, not to say that it's necessarily a bad shot, but it's so much easier to make it a great shot or a shot that is successful when you have at least some of that shape carved out by by a rim light or a highlight. Well, what I wanted to say before I forget, that, um, like, well, two things. I think these images that if I had captured it with the SL2, generally would look the same in terms of my eye and the way that I work, but I still think it, they look differently um, as if how I would have shot it with the M10R and that, that close focus. So that's kind of why I started working with this a lot. Um, also too, is like traveling now is like, well, now I know I can like say travel with this setup and they see uh, my 35. I'm good to go. It's like, um, it's so much more freeing uh, in terms of like all the gear that I have to take. So that's the other reason why I really like to set up now. Like I can, like I'm going to go travel in a, in a few weeks uh, for a shoot and I know I can just go with this in the lens and that'd be good. Yeah. And having that free mind is such an important thing when you're taking photos. We're ending on this banger, man. I Okay. I love the drink, the chair, again, the colors. It's, it's yep. for me, it's when you, when you do color, I already know you're bringing, you're bringing a nice palette. Yeah. I mean, I, when I saw that chair, I knew I wanted to use it. And so it was actually before I shot the portrait with the, the girl in the red, I shot this and uh, I knew that I was just waiting for the perfect cocktail to come out and, this was like a, some spritzer and so it was like perfect, very refreshing. And then the way the light was coming, this is just all window light to the um, the, the light coming through the window. And I just kind of positioned that chair to get those angles and the shadows and took a couple of frames and that was it. This reminds me of a job I did years ago. I didn't know anything. I landed, it was for lug, a luxury jewelry brand. 
And they hired me because I was, wasn't a jewelry photographer. They hired me because I was a street photographer and they wanted something different. And my main struggle, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I failed at the job. I, th I think, I think my pictures suck. I got published. Sure I, I got one of them published in an ad in, in a magazine and I thought that was cool, but overall I wasn't happy with the images and it's for one main reason. I, I didn't know, do I focus, do I make it a jewelry shot or do I make it about the entire image? And I should have listened to the fact that they didn't hire me because I was a jewelry photographer, but I still tried to make myself a jewelry photographer. I don't know if that makes any sense, but no, for me, I completely understand. Yeah. It's, it's the image. The image itself, it's not just about the drink, the mm -hmm. framing, the composition, the light, the color palette that sells the drink. If I look at this, I don't care if it's completely out of focus. If the drink is completely out of focus, the image itself is just so pleasing. But then, you you know, you have the drink. It It's there. I see it. I understand that it's an image of a drink. But if it's not. Like for me, I, and, and again, this could just be my opinion. I'm one person, I'm one photographer, I'm one set of eyes. But for me, I look at an image like this and yeah, okay. I know it's an, an image of a drink, but I'm looking at the entire package and the entire package is what sells me. And I think that's what's so successful about your images is you make it way more than just about the drink. It's about the entire scene. Um. I mean, I, thank you. I, I, I uh, try to figure out how to answer this. I think it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier that, I, you know, I have images of it's more probably, I think there's a couple vertical where I really focus more on the cocktail. But for me, I like to give that whole spread, like that whole vibe, that energy, like it looks like, you know, you would sit down somewhere and, you know, you're at some Italian hotel and, sitting down and having a spritzer you know so like that's the kind of vibe and mood that i wanted to get um and i think i have a couple other frames where i had it wasn't a real model but i had someone sit down and grab the cocktail and it, that kind of a um feeling of it too but i think in my if i had to do it over again i would still keep it this way but then i'd like to have like a real model in there and being able to use that to add to the, the campaign Mm, interesting. I always love hearing how photographers would change an image or, you know, we see the final image. We don't see what went into it. We don't see the outtakes. We don't see the process leading up to it, or even where it falls in. You know, you might have taken six images. Was this the first one you took? Was it the last one? Was it right in the middle of the bunch? Stuff like right that is middle. always interesting. Yeah. Was it right in the middle? Yeah. So usually what I do is like the first maybe two or three images I shot vertical and really focused on the cocktail and then I stepped back a little bit and then took some um horizontal uh kind of like a mid 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 wide shot and then I tried to incorporate more lifestyle into it. those didn't work out the greatest but these uh, really worked out I thought no I I totally think it works we're uh so we got an, another question in. I love when we yeah. get some questions in. I can't. I always yeah, come to sure. these just ready to to chat and look at some images. But hey, if we got some questions, uh, uh, JG yeah, has uh, a question on the M system. Yeah. So can you give a little a little breakdown on the M system? So he's asking, what is the M system? So the M system uh, is, um, I it's. I mean, like I'm not a great historian, but this camera is. This is the M10R, and like as kind of i guess cut their teeth so to speak um going back to like cartier Bresson and like the 40s and probably even earlier where this system is i think really made for street photography everything is manual manual focus everything um but you can obviously change lenses on it but um it's just their uh system for uh doing that kind of work. Um, so I wanted to take this system and add it more to my repertoire in terms of the food and cocktail. And like I said, I wasn't really able to do that until this close focus uh, summer Lux came out. And so I'm slowly like doing more work in what I do with this. Um, so I don't know if that answers his 
uh, JD's question, but it's very, um, I don't want to say bare bones because this is like, it's the way this thing is engineered. It's, a, it's amazing. It's just, it's very hard to use. Very, very hard to use. Um, and then I answered, I think, Chris's question earlier about using strobes with the AM and absolutely like that one with the, the martini service when I had the two strobes for sure. Um, it is, like I said, but it's, it's, it's difficult to kind of nail in how you want it to look. And then uh, he had another question about tethered. Um, I, I only ever shoot tethered uh, Interesting. on location. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, especially for food and cocktail, because one, the client usually on set and they want to see like, you know, what they kind of will look like. And obviously if you've never worked with them before, they want to make sure, you know, you know, it's nice to see for them to see, you know, what you're doing. And, it instills confidence. But, yeah. And it, but it also helps me like, versus like, you know, if I'm looking at a, a three inch screen, my eyes aren't the greatest anymore. So like to be able to know that I got the critical focus shooting on tethered is it's, it's a game changer. Um, I have students that I teach that are still kind of on the fence about shooting tethered and, and doing what we do. And I'm like, it's a no brainer. You have to. Um, yeah. I, I was going to so, ask yeah. that because my, my eyes look, I've, I've always had 20, 20 vision, but when I shoot manual focus, I don't care what kind of eyes you have looking through a, a viewfinder or looking at the back of an LCD screen. My eyes be lying to me, man. I think I swear yeah. stuff is in focus and I, and I shoot wide open and then I get it up and it's like, I think I went out a whole night of shooting manually focused and I came back and I'm like, great. Two of them are in focus. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's different in street photography, but, but you know, you're on set doing food and cocktail and, and all portraits. Like you want to be able to look over and get your computer and see it in a much bigger screen and know that you, you know, you got what you needed. Um, yeah. What I would say though, though, when I'm using this, I can't shoot tethered. There's no, at least that I know of, there's no way to tether it. It doesn't have that port to, to plug it, the, the cable into with most cameras. Um, I don't think that M11 has it, but then I don't ever, I haven't really worked with the M11. Um, okay. But so that's the only drawback to that camera, I guess. What do you have coming up? So as you kind of dropped it in there, but I think it's important to to point out that you do workshops with Leica Academy. So yeah, what do you got coming up, man? You. Thank you for that. Uh, so I have what's what sold out, but I have the San Francisco Academy coming up in February or in a couple of weeks um, with Mr. Jews in San Francisco. And then I have a Chicago um, Academy coming up in April and there's still a few um Spots for that, and that's going to be with uh, a couple of uh, spots in Chicago, and working with the guys at. Uh, oh God, I can't even remember the name. We, we won't put the pressure on you. <laughs> yeah, it's it's on like his website. Oh, <laughs> Brains fried. Check out the website, everyone. Oh, well, B We're in Billy Sun. I'm doing cocktails with Billy Sunday. And then um, it, it's a restaurant called Jong, J-E-O-N-G. It's a Korean-inspired uh, high-end restaurant in Chicago. So we'll be working there um, doing that. And then I have a couple other things that I want to drop yet um, with Leica. So um, once those are finalized, then I'll drop those. But Awesome. Um, we'll, we'll get you back yeah. on to talk updates. Yeah, and I'll, I'll make sure I have my, my stash drilling. Dude, I'm, 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 but I'm, telling I'm throwing you, you if off if it's not again, there. <laughs> if I come on and have growing this thing and yours is not there, I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm keeping it, man. I'm keeping yeah. it. But just, well, just know, you. if you log on and it's not there, I'm telling Danny, I said, pull the plug. Technical difficulties, <laughs> we're out. Yeah, okay. All right. No, well, that, thanks for having me. Jim, it's, it's always really great having you on. With you. Yeah. It's No, it's, it's always a pleasure, man. It's always good chopping you up, you know, chopping it up with you offline as well but it's good to get you on here and to hear uh, you know what's going on in your brain when you're you're taking these images we're gonna we're gonna get uh jim's instagram dropped on there danny's dropping that as we speak in the comment section it's uh, underscore medium raw jim website where can uh, we find jim more Sull uh just jim sullivan photography.com um yeah that's uh about it i guess there you go well jim yeah. huge thank you to you Thank you. And uh, to Leica for introducing us.
you know, yeah, it's, thank you like I said, it's great, man. It's it's great to be able to build out. And uh, I'm asking for a I friend mean, here. When are you doing a workshop in New York, man? Come on. Oh, okay. So well, that's kind of what I was referring to. Um, since they just opened a new gallery uh, there, so um, I'm I'm been really we'll kind of we'll keep our eyes that. peeled. Yeah, in DC, I'm pushing DC too. So. There you go. Well, yeah. look, we'll keep pushing for you. Hopefully we'll Thank get you out here on the East Coast. We'll hit up a diamond yeah. together. There we go. Oh, dude, I would love that so much. No right. idea. It's in the books, Thank man. You. Jim, huge thank you. you. Always good having you on, man. To all of our viewers yeah. out there. We hope you thank guys you. enjoyed this and the rest of our series. You can check out all of our recorded content at YouTube, b and Event Space on there. Jim, good to talk to you as always, man. And uh, I'll catch you offline. All right, brother. Talk to you soon. Later. Later.